great. Hello, all you hardcore boxing fans out there. How are you doing? It's Big P here. You know. You know. Right then. I've got my friend from London, Terry. How are you doing, Terry? He's coming on the channel. We're going to have a chat. Oh, mate, mate. How are you being, kid? Yeah, I've been good. Ah, so it's a weekly thing now, isn't it? We're, yeah, we're, we're like more coming wise. Yeah, we're like cannon and ball, aren't we? <laughs> hey. Do you remember that cannon and ball? Little and large. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's just a bit before my time, but I've seen the reruns. Have you? Brilliant. <laughs> uh, what have you been up to, Terry? You're still grafting away, still a banker in the London. How's interest rate going? Mate, the interest rates will stay low for a long time. Um, no one knows what's going on with this economy, if I'm being honest with you. Yeah. It, it, not, all, all the rules are falling apart now. So everyone's just trying to do what they can do to survive, if you, if you yeah. notice. So, look, if it, anyone that's struggling out there, look, let's just hope it gets better. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you, mate. I agree with you. Uh, we'll go straight. We'll go straight in then. Uh, well, well, we might as well start off with uh, Dennis's uh, bit of news. Obviously, we'll we'll not put the the second bit of news out because Dennis hasn't put that out yet. But we'll put regarding Josh. But we'll put the first bit of news out. Tommy Frank against Kyle Youssef for the British title at. Uh, a drive-in in Sheffield and it's going to be filmed uh, by the sounds of it in a studio for Eurosport and they're both going to get paid well and uh, it looks like Dennis has uh, been grafting hard doesn't he behind the scenes instead of laid on settee drinking expensive red wine and eating balsamic vinegar crisps <laughs> what do you think is, is, it, is it a good move what do you think I like Den, and Den's one of these guys. You know, we've said it many times, Paul. Yeah. He, he's just a survivor, isn't he? he like Nick Hennessy, yeah. Yes, yeah. These guys will always be there, or thereabouts, and then every few years they get their time in the spotlight, and then they'll drift back into the background and they'll come back out again. Yeah, you know, and, and I think deep down, Den probably just loves that. You know, he lo he must love the comebacks. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's like he's the Frank Sinatra in of boxing, Danny. <laughs> Yeah, he's got yeah, he's got the singing voice as well. But I am happy for Tommy Frank. I'm not gonna lie. I think Tommy's a good lad. I think in in all the the talk of other guys in his weight class, he's kind of got overshadowed a bit. But Tommy's a he's a good lad, hard worker. Like like he's one of these guys that always drafts, and it'll be good for him to because he, he already won the Commonwealth. It'd be good for him to win the British, and then you know that opens up some really interesting fights for him, you know, in and around that weight. So. Let's let's see what happens. Oh, look, I like Tommy. I've got a bit of a soft spot for him, you know. So it would be hard for me to criticise on this one. I'm just happy for him. Yeah, he's likable, Tommy, isn't he? That nah, he's a good guy. Uh, I've given Tommy, I've given Tommy a bit of stick, and I've I've given Dennis loads of stick. Obviously, obviously, you've you've been out with me and Dennis several times, and you've seen me and Dennis get at it over certain issues. Uh, I'm I'm a I, I made a lot of noise uh, in in uh, up at Dennis's regarding Tommy Frank and Sonny Edwards, and I wanted it to happen. And Dennis uh, always used to say, "Oh, why do you have to fly off at Andal? It'll happen when money's right." And blah de blah. But it appears that Pre Sports TV didn't uh, rate it as a fight as an headliner for because of Sonny's, Sonny's style, whereas they like Tommy Frank's style, but. Now Dennis is with Eurosport. That it looks like they're all for it with Tommy and Kyle Youssef. Do you think that Sonny Edwards' style is not as exciting for fans, Terry? Ah, uh, I'm sure the next thirty seconds will get me on Boxing Asylum. So here goes. <laughs> Sonny Edwards is a talented boxer. Sonny Edwards is skilled. Sonny Edwards is good. Yeah. You know, he's a guy that, as a technician, you can't fault him. You can't fault his amateur record. You can't fault his pro record. I just don't watch his fights. I don't watch his fights because nothing annoys me more than a guy who's levels above his opponent and can't take him out. It, it, it does two things, Russ. It shows a lack of respect for what boxing's about at the pro level and it wastes my time and my time is precious. You think that Sonny Edwards wins a world title? I've said it before. The role of Sonny Edwards is 
to get fattened up, right? Like a like a like a bunny rabbit. Now he's going to get fattened up, and then they're going to feed him to one of Bob Arum's Mexicans or Panamanians or Nicaraguans or one of those guys, yeah. and he ain't going to be able to run around the ring for twelve rounds. And he's gonna he's gonna to have to find out, just like his brother did. He's gonna to have to find out that, you know, in the Western world, being five foot four and forty seven kilos, whatever he is, is a sign of weakness. And in Latin America, being that size is a sign of strength. They're just, they're just stronger at that weight. Their little guys are stronger than our little guys. It's as simple as that. And that's not to disrespect how talented Sonny is. It's just the reality. There's no, there are no big paydays for Sonny Edwards in Britain or even in Europe. So you've got to go over to Latin America and basically he'll get the Georgie Jump treatment. You know when Georgie Jump went to fight Burchell and yeah. he found out that there's levels to boxing. I think that's what will happen. Yeah. Uh, Dennis working with Steffi Ball. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what do you think to that? There are no real enemies in boxing, Russ. Yeah. Now, uh, let me illustrate a point. Danny Connor likes to talk shit about me, right? Mm -hmm. So let me just say to you, in 2016, Danny Connor used to love the New Age Boxing Podcast, thought I was doing a great job. In 2017, Danny Connor wanted to be on the New Age Boxing Podcast. In 2018, Danny asked me the same question again. Can I be on the New Age Podcast? In 2019, Danny Connor asked me to train him. And I said no. But Danny Connor talks all kinds of crap about me that I'm not relevant, I'm not this, I'm not that. Whereas in person, he's like, I love how you train people. I love this, I love that. So do you, people, boxing is just full of nonsense. Like you, just, you just learn not to take it personally. And I think that's what Dennis has done. He's just gone, look, I deal with problems when they arise, but I don't hold a grudge. If we've got to make money together, we make money together. Because your ultimate loyalty, Russ, is to the fighter you represent. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I've just finished filming. Uh, I've just done, a, I've been doing, uh, I've been putting footage together with, with Josh Whaler, uh, Mickey's Athletic, that's his dad's gym in Brampton. And we've got 24 lots of footage and I've just sent that off now for to go into production for all inserts and a bit of jazzing up. And that's obviously, that's not my fight. It's Dennis's fight, isn't it, Joshua? I've just done that. I'm, I've been asked to do a Cash Alley one. And Cash is tonight, as we speak, is sparring uh, Huey Fury in Cheshire. He's going to be there all week. And Peter asked me, when, when did I go to Peter's Wait, last week or week before to do that with Huey? He says, can you help me out with any sparring? Obviously, Pete has asked me a, f a few times about boxing. Can I get a pad man? I got him Robin Reed. Can I get a, a strength and conditioner? I got him Bunny. Can I get him sparring? So I've got Cash Alley in there. And, uh, so to say that Sonny Edwards said that Dennis has disowned me. <laughs> Not really too bad, am I? But no, no, I, don't, no. I, don't take it, I don't take it personally. I think that a lot of people and on social media, I think uh, people, what they don't know, they make up. And I don't really reply to it now. I think I just I'll plod on. No, I no, be in it. No, no. These YouTubers and these internet people need to understand. Yeah. We all see each other in person. I've seen Danny Connor loads of times in person. He doesn't say the same stuff he tweets. Yeah. If, Danny, if, if Danny had the balls to come up to me in person and say, mate, this is what I think then we'd have it out as men, however it ends, it ends. If Sonny Edwards had the same balls, fair enough. These guys don't. And the reason they don't is behind the scenes, they ask who someone is, and then they just go, ah, okay. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't realized. <laughs> I, got my, you know I, mean? I got my information wrong. And you just go, okay, whatever. Because at some point, we've all got to dance together. So there's no point in making enemies in boxing. That's the thing I've learned over time. Even even when we come on and do shows like this, Russ, yeah, I don't say anything I wouldn't say to the person's face. So I have no issues saying to Sonny, I don't watch your fights. And I tell him why. I have no issues saying to Danny Connor, I think you're a two-faced rat. And I tell him why. Yeah. I have no issue with that. But, but on more positive news, look, your channel's growing. What I'm doing is growing. We're becoming more relevant as time goes on. So we just need to focus on what we do. And we need to just make sure that the people listening are entertained and they're informed. That's all we do, Russ. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. But uh, 
The funny thing is, I actually rate Sonny Edwards, and I were asked if I thought Sonny had beat Tommy, and I said, yeah. Obviously, it went down like a fucking lead balloon at the time. <laughs> but I just said, going on Tommy's last performance, I said, I think he beats him then. Uh, you know, the, no, the basic for me, Yeah, but for me, Tommy's got to learn how to how to cut the ring off. Yeah. Right, don't just... You can't follow Sonny Edwards, because then it's, it's a field day. You've oh got to be able God, to... It'd be, it's, it'd fool, if you wanted to chase Sonny around ring, it would just pick you off, wouldn't it? Yeah, so, so you've got to be able to cut that ring off and sometimes instead of taking a step forward, you've got to take one back just to, just to you know what I mean, even up those angles. And yeah, well, yeah, well my, my big grape with the Sonny Edwards, Tommy Frank load of knackers or whatever they want to call it, I said, Dennis, where are we going here? There's a chance here to go for bidding with, with board or purse bids. Sonny Edwards against Tommy Frank for the British title. What the fuck are we doing here? What is what, what are we in boxing for? I mean, it's a British title. It's a fucking. It's, and he were like, "Oh, it's a bigger fight down the line." And and you know, so I'm not most patient person in the world. That's probably why I spent all that time in jail. But I just flipped my lid and I went, "What? What? what, what fucking! It's a British title. It's like some mega belt in it." You ask people who haven't got a belt, Robin Reed, Nigel Ben. You ask them what they how they feel about a British title. They'd love a British title on the mantelpiece to go with their WBC titles. I said, "What are we in boxing for? He's got a, he's got to fight him, and obviously, that boat sailed now, and it looks like Kyle Yusuf. But I don't think it, I don't think it's going to be the same if Tommy beats Kyle. I mean, and if he loses against him, well, they're going to be begging for Sonny Edwards fight then, aren't they? Well, I'd have thought so, wouldn't you? Because they've got where's yeah, he? But then, but then, if he wins and he wins impressively, he'll get, he'll get, he'll get a world get title, won't he? Yeah, yeah, he'll get a world title, won't he? But then Tommy also has to be careful that he doesn't get fed to a Mexican as well. Like, look, we have to just be absolutely clear because we don't have many little guys that go on to make it in the sport. Definitely not from Britain. They normally get fed to the Latin Americans, chewed up and spat out. That's all. Uh, to, be, to be honest with you, I, I, I think Tommy, Tommy against Flores for IBO is a good fight. I mean, Tommy's been with his trainer since he was 10 years old. They've got, they've got they're really close. Glyn Rhodes is an old school spitter. He's a Jimmy Tibbs type character, isn't he? You know, he's an old school trainer, isn't he? He's not one of them that's at after parties and hanging out at back of everybody like Dave Caldwell and, you know, people. Like, Glyn's an old school trainer and they have a certain standard in that gym, whereas they've all got a bit of pride about themselves. You look at all the kids he's fetched through, Sheedy. Sheedy won a Commonwealth and he ended up with a good ranking. Tommy. All them sort of kids from that gym, they're all, they're all like a Glyn roll, clones of Glyn. They've all got a bit okay. of pride in the work, a bit of class. Do you know what I mean? I'm, Look, I'm I've, got, I've got a lot of respect for Glyn, but it, what, what I would ask is why haven't they gone any further? Yeah. You know, oh. for, me, for me, you can't keep churning up British champ after British champ because at some point I'm going to say, look, you won't give me someone who can go further. Yeah. Now, it might, it might be that he hasn't got the raw materials to work with. And I think sometimes you can be a good trainer, but you've just never been given that, that athlete that can take you to the next level. Well, I think, do you know what I think it is? I think it's because Glyn Rhodes, he's like Mick Whale. They're not willing to kiss arse. They're not willing to hang out the back of people. Have you ever, you've been to enough, you've been to enough shows with me over years to see that people go to these shows and they're hanging out of the back of promoters. Glyn yeah. Rhodes, Mick Whale. You don't see them at after parties, mate. They go home. Nah, nah. Glyn, Glyn, oh, Glyn will come, it. shake hands. Hey, yeah, yeah. yeah, Glyn will literally come, shake hands, have a little Coca-Cola, like Chris Smedley does. Smedley will show up, Chris shake Smedley hands. Chris don't go to after parties. He might turn up, have, have, have one drink, a pop, because he doesn't drink, Chris, and they go yeah. on. They're, they're, not, they're not that clicky type. They're not yeah. click it. Do you know what I mean? And I, I think that's the fundamental problem in boxing, me, personally. I think it is. And I think it it spoils it because there's people getting opportunities all the time who are in the certain click. And I've noticed that yeah. now. Yeah, but Russ, you it's the game. Like, I'm trying to think. Whatever, whatever industry you're in, legal otherwise, yeah? 
you're only as good as your network. Like if you're if you're in the drug game, and you and you grew up with a kid that gets Colombia's finest, you're first in line. Well, you're if, you nearly triggering me there mentioning Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> really triggered no, me there, true. Terry. Fucking hell. Yeah. Like, like, for example, Russ. Promise me you'll not mention Afghanistan. I'll have to get foil out. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. We'll be all right, mate. We'll be all right. And it's the same with music, right? It's the same with music. If you've got a mate who makes the music, chances are you'll get a chance as well. You're only as good as your network. So I respect guys like Glenn and Chris Smedley because what they say is, I just want to be in the gym training fighters. But there's some people whose ambition is, I want to train world champions. I want to be on TV. I want to be on the biggest stage. And I think there's room in boxing for both guys. Now, I'm a guy where, man, I just love training amateurs. I love being in a gym with loads of people, just shoot. I mean, just, just kicking back, laughing, joking, telling stories, listening to the old timers. I'll give you an example. Like last week, I was out having lunch and we bumped into a guy called Keith Bristol. Keith's brilliant. He, he boxed at light heavyweight from about 1980 to 1989. Hard as nails. Him and Dennis Andrews, hard as nails. Those guys used to go at it. And, like, you still see him now. He loves the sport. And we get to sit down and pick his brain about stuff. That's what I love about boxing, mate. Um, some people love being on TV, and that's cool. And I love that boxing gives you opportunities to do all of that stuff. But one doesn't make you better than the other. We're all in this together. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. But, like I said, I wish... Uh, I know what... I know what money Dennis has lost on shows in the last six years. I've seen it with my own eyes, and I'm like, Whoa. you know, how can you keep doing this? But, you know, the, the love's a sport, doesn't he? You know, my heart bleeds for him with, 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 with that. Because I, I think that we've had so much and we've dominated that much over the last 10 years. But for the six years that I've been bouncing about with Dennis, I, I feel that he hasn't, had what his Jews. I mean, obviously, back in the day, he were riding high, wasn't he, with certain individuals, you know, David A., Carl Thompson, Clinton Woods, Ricky Atten, Jamie McDonald to a certain extent, till, you know, he stabbed anything back. But Stewie Hall, I mean, I, I just feel that he's due a, Dennis is due a break, you know, with, with boxing and. I'm hoping that this drive in, this, I mean, it's but, somewhat, I'm hoping this is going to turn it round for him. But it's like I've said to Den, what is it you want to do? Do you want to put on shows? Do you want to guide someone to the top? But I think sometimes you've got to have a single focus. You can't say, I want to do four or five different things. You've got to have a single focus. And it might just be, I want to bring boxing back to Sheffield. That's cool. Mm -hmm. He might say, I want to find one kid who I can take to a world title. And that's also cool. But to do that, might need a different approach. But whichever way Den does it, he's got the knowledge, he's got the tools, he's got the skills to do it all. So, and he's got the luxury that he can choose whatever he wants to do. And not many people in boxing have that luxury. Yeah. Yeah, I see, I see what you mean. Yeah, I, don't, I just feel that... I, I think that, that Matcham have been so dominant that everybody else has been knocked over by it. I don't think they've seen it coming. I don't think Mick Ennis has seen it coming. I don't think Dennis did. I don't think Barry McGuigan did. I think they were all like... Every... No, I think they did. They just they chose not to listen to us because... Yeah, maybe maybe you might be right. Maybe you might be right. Look, uh, mate, look, remember we talked about this before. I don't know if it was on the show or off, the, off camera. I remember Eddie Hearn walking into Fitzroy Lodge going... Can we train Audley Harrison here? And I remember sending him off. Ten years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I remember sending him off to Lillian Bayless. It was like a, a sister facility. We had about five minutes walk away. You know, leaking roof, rickety ring, and that's where they trained for a bit. Yeah. That was Eddie Hearn. Like he was, he was so far behind everyone else when he started. Yeah. But all he did was say, "Okay, I can't beat these guys by playing." their game, so I'm going to do it differently. But don't underestimate how important Sky were in what Hearn became. Because it was Sky that said, we want extravaganzas. It wasn't Hearn who said we want extravaganzas. If Hearn had his way, he'd still be doing shows in the Brentwood Centre. It was Sky that said, we need to aim higher. Mm -hmm. And they pushed Hearn to push harder. 
And then Hearn suddenly found his role as the as the heel, as the Vince McMahon character, you know, the lightning rod. So all fans could hate him while ignoring his fighters and just still, you know, he took all the heat. So Hearn was smart, but he didn't do it by himself. He had a massive TV organization behind it who gave him the, the inspiration and they execute. It's Sky that do the execution, not necessarily natural. Mm. Yeah. All right then. Well, like I said, we'll, uh, we'll not mention... Josh's Josh Wales uh, fight, yeah. We'll let Dennis announce that. Otherwise, I'll end up going in Dennis's crusher in his scrapyard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll let we'll let them announce that with Josh's fight. But uh, we've we've talked about Tommy Franks against Kyle Youssef. Let's hope that that all goes through. November twentieth, British title. Uh, both undefeated kids. It's a good fight. Now, what I want to talk about now is. Are British boxers getting to British, getting to the British level and maybe a touch above and being found out at world level? I'm just going to throw you a few names at you. Dylan White, Gavin Reese. I know Gavin won a world title, didn't he? But he didn't really beat anybody that were world level, did he? He got that. Tony Bellew. Tony Bellew didn't beat anybody at world level, did he? He, he more or less fluked to WBC, didn't he? Paul Smith, Lee Purdy, Luke Campbell, Stephen Smith, David Price. All them guys there all got bludgeoned, right? Bludgeoned, mullered. Were they blagging it into that position or should they have learnt their craft? I don't like to bring this up about Clinton Woods, Carl Froch, because... They, but, but they learnt their craft, didn't they? But, but I could also say Robin Reed, but Robin Reed bypassed all that and he pulled it off in Italy, didn't he? So he, that were a roll of the dice from Frank Warren, wasn't it? But these others here, they didn't really consolidate at British level, did they? And when they were thrown in at the deep end, they were found wanting. Do you agree? And why is that? Maybe it's a generational thing, Russ. So... I look at you know, a like, question oh, I'm going to ask you about trainers, but go on, Terry, I'll let you have yeah. So, so look at guys like Froch and Clinton Woods. They're lads that were running around in the 70s and the 80s, whenever it was, playing football every Saturday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., going for long walks with their mates, you know, to the next village or the next town. They were active kids. They were kids swinging from branches, doing pull-ups. They, these were active kids. They were also kids who probably fought once or twice a week, regular, when they were young. Yeah. So... Meaning school so playground. <laughs> no, yeah. no, you laugh, but, but think about these little things. It's almost like Karate Kid. You know when he's doing the wax on, wax off? Yeah. And all this stuff transfers. So when you walk into a boxing gym, you, you already have a, a high degree of fitness. You already know how to have a fight psychologically. Yeah. You know all of these things already. All we're doing now is teaching you the art and the science of boxing. Yeah. We're not having to teach you how to be fit. Now, with modern guys, they've got strength and conditioning coaches. And they've got those rusts because kids now aren't as strong as like Carl Froch's generation. That's the problem. So you've got these kids coming in with a strength and conditioning guy. But you can't replace years and years of running up those hills in Sheffield, you know, whether it's Walkley. Um, up by Sky Edge, wherever it is you're running up those hills, riding your bike up those hills, and you're getting those extra blood vessels, and you're getting those wider blood vessels as you grow up. Mm. And so that's probably what Clinton had. So Clinton's got this insane fitness added to a work ethic that you, you don't seem to see in kids anymore. And that's why he was able to hang at world level. And it's if you look no at all Clinton. the guys who... Yeah, sorry, go on. No, so if you look at all the guys at world level now, they all came from that sort of background. Like, there, there are no manufactured guys at world level. And the problem with Britain is we believe we can manufacture champions. Oh, if we just navigate you the right way, we can get you there. That's why, as much as you respect Matchroom, their guys get knocked out. At the top level, their guys get stopped or embarrassed because yeah. they've tried to take the, the, the clever route instead of going, look, get fit, get strong, but here's the most important thing no one talks about, Russ. Learn to make better decisions when you're in the ring. A lot of British boxers are what I call corner-to-corner -corner guys. They take their instructions, do it for three minutes. Take more instructions, do it.
do it for three minutes. If those instructions don't work, they're screwed for that whole round. I want to see more boxers making decisions in the ring. I want, I want them to be able to say, this guy keeps hitting that jab to the body. Okay, how am I going to nullify that? Let me step back and leave an uppercut next time. That will teach him. Which is what top-level boxers should be doing, and they're just not doing that anymore. Yeah. Do you, you know, when I look back at, uh, obviously, Carl Froch and Clinton Woods, uh, they were both at the top of the game world level for seven years. Clinton from Roy Jones up to Cloud and Froch from, you know, uh, Pascal all the way up to George Groves. You know, it's, uh, I think Froch's were six years, Clinton's were seven years, you know, at world level and they were fight to keep at that level for that period of time uh, is phenomenal. And don't forget, these were, I don't like to compare this to Joe Calzaghe, but Joe Calzaghe's 10-year run compared to their six and seven-year were a bit easier than the, the hard fights that they had because Dennis matched Clinton Woods hard, didn't he? We know that Ennessy and Eddie Earn matched Frotch hard. But, and you can put Calzaghe in that mix as well, but he had a lot of easy ones, didn't he? You know, he had 20... But also on, sorry. I was going to say, Calzaghe is a perfect example of what I mean, right? I've seen the gym where they trained in that area where they lived, Russ. Yeah. You don't want to be running three miles up those hills. It's some hills, isn't it? Yeah, hills, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so you imagine from when you were young, you've been running up those hills. You're a lot better than a kid in London who was just running over flat ground. Like, just, just by definition. Well, Frotch used to do his runs up Donkey Hill in Nottingham, and that's like a mountain. It's very similar mm. to what Joe were doing in Valleys. And Clinton used you know, to, Clinton were running were very hilly as well. Sheffield's built on seven hills. Yeah, know? it's crazy. Yeah. Whereas I think I think Ward was just running up Mount Everest and that's how he was able to dominate I, Another thing as well, before we set off, why have you always got a photograph of Andre Ward on your profile picture? Why why Mate, do I have to look at that? Because I need I need you to understand. <laughs> yeah, I, I need you to understand how you felt that night after round two when you were just like, my hero's getting absolutely destroyed. Look at him eating four rounds. Well, after elbow. round seven, when they changed game plan and Carl Froch put his foot down, I, I thought he was going to pull it off and he ran out of rounds, didn't he? He, he got a game plan. Nah, he, he, Ward, Ward just isn't. After round six, Ward was like, my work here is done, people. Stayed out of way, didn't he? No, I didn't. He, nah, come on, Porky. Go and watch the fight again. I Andre got stuck in when he needed to. Mate. Look, look. At the end of the well, day... Ward lashed up at Andy. were glad to get out of the game. Who, Froch? Ward looked to me like he'd got lumps all over his head and that. No, Joe, you know, I heard he played basketball in the morning after the fight. Scored, scored 52 what, points. For Jones? Yeah, man, like, he's just like, it was the easiest night's work he's ever had. Who like, to Nottingham, though, for rematch? Well, who would? I, w- I wouldn't go to Nottingham for a stag beat. <laughs> you know what, Terry? You're, you're a, you, met, you met Andre Ward at Fitzroy Lodge as your hero now. <laughs> Mate, I want to go out and see him in San Francisco. I'll, I'll, te- I'll, take you, I'll take you over to the Cobras and we'll have, a, we'll have a pint of Guinness at the Cobras and you'll be a team Cobra then. All right, I'll, take I'll, I'll probably have to pay for it as well. <laughs> no, yeah, no, yeah, I won't do that. I'll, I'll, we'll take our own. <laughs> <laughs> he will charge us for that as well, corkage. Listen, if you met Carl, you'd love him, mate. Honestly, he's a bit dry on that, and yeah. I tell you when I no, I tell you when I did meet him, um, Golovkin Brook weighing. Yeah, and it, it was him. Like you know, he's got that kind of tweedy jacket. I think he just bought it because he started wearing it everywhere. Yeah. But, ah, man. And he had the Cuban heels on, which kind of made him look about two inches tall. It looked like he had platform shoes on. So he was still very insecure. No, no, no. So, yeah, he's, he's still insecure about stuff. But, you know, he's one of British boxing's greats. Like, I take the piss, but oh, Carl's one of British boxing's greats. Look at his CV, man. There's only Lennox Lewis beat more, more champions than Frotch in, in, in all of British fighters that have ever been born. Lennox Lewis has beat them more than anybody. Frotch is in ah, place. I've got another point, Porky. This is what I wanted to say about the previous thing, right? Oh. Look at Frotch Groves 1. Yeah. Right? There's no question George Groves was a superior guy that night. I was there right? that night ringside, mate. Me and my uh, kid's mum, we were drunk as skunks. 
Yeah, so so there's no question George was the better man in that fight, but George yeah. couldn't sustain it. Yeah. And so this is what I mean about the generational difference. Cost him, inexperience cost Groves that night. Not so much inexperience, Russ. I just don't think he had the the stamina in those legs. He didn't have the toughness in that body yeah. that Carl had. And I've read Carl's book, so I understand where that comes from now. But he didn't have that 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 resilience. And you can't manufacture that. Like that's earned. Do you see what I mean? It's earned. And if George had, had that, I don't think the fight would have gone eight rounds. But he didn't have it, and that's what gave Carl a chance. And it's why, deep down, I believe Carl Froch could come back now and pick up a British title at Super Middle. Oh, yeah. Look, you know, that night, I've spoke to Carl Froch many, many times about that fight. We went, we went out for a meal uh, two weeks after that fight. And let me tell you this, in Nottingham, right, in this Italian restaurant, me and my kid's mum, and I said to him, what happened? <laughs> I know he got the win, like, didn't he? But... And obviously, I, I was trying to tell, I'm trying to tell a world champion boxer that, what, what he should have been doing and that, which I felt a bit embarrassed about. But he was all right about it. I said, you know what he did? I said to him, right, and my kid's mum tapped me under the table with a foot. I said, when he was hitting you with the right hand, why didn't you move to the opposite side? And he just said he didn't know because probably because he was still concussed from your from the first round. Because in the sixth round, Groves, did he hit him with 16 or set? He hit him with loads of punches in the sixth round. But that yeah. was when he emptied the tank, didn't he? So exactly. Frotcher's chin and his steeliness got him through that six. And George Groves went back to the corner and he thought, what have I got to do to get this guy out of here or to get the fight stopped? And I think that was the turning point because Carl said when he came out for the seventh, Groves couldn't knock an N over. He couldn't even tickle his chin. He said, and he took confidence from that. And I'll go on record and say that. And what I do want to say while we're on this point is, and even though he lives near me, when, he, when Howard Foster's book comes out, Howard Foster is going to tell the true story about, you know, the last round where he froch threw all them punches at Groves and Groves slumped into his arms and he'd had all them... Nah, but uh, oh, how Foster yeah, choked him out. Right, you what? Howard Foster just choked him out. Oh, he choked him out. All right, then, well, Groves went to the Manchester hospital and they said, you've got a concussion, so they kept him in till the morning. Now, if that man had a concussion, don't forget, you've got rest around eight. Or is it around, sorry, rest around nine, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. 10, 11, and 12. So you've got 10 and a half minutes left in the fight and they kept him in for a concussion. So what would another 10 and a half minutes have done? So did Howard Foster save his life? And why did Eddie Earn and Matchroom and them not mention anything about Groves' concussion and blah de blah Well, well no, 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 you, you, no. Well, hold on, hold on, Ross. No, they wanted but to tell said, match, didn't they? Go on. No, but you just said Carl was concussed as well. No, I didn't say Carl was concussed. I said Groves were concussed. No. You said Carl was concussed from the first round. Oh, yeah, but they still left him fighting, didn't they? But we're talking exactly. about Groves yeah. here, aren't we? Because Groves no, no, but in trouble, aren't we? No, but it's the same point, right? If both guys are concussed... But Carl didn't say then... to me he was concussed. I'm saying to you, he was probably concussed because he'd had that much punishment over the sixth round. But he still kept ploughing forward, didn't he? But Kvrotch wasn't, wasn't in hospital, was he? He never ended up in hospital all night, did he? Groves were kept in overnight, wasn't he? That's the point I'm talking ah, about. He was a, yeah, no, no, point taken. But, you know, oh. when you lose a fight the way Groves did, yeah, precautions, I understand that. If, if they'd stopped the fight after the first round, they'd have had Proch in an ambulance. Yeah, but then we'd have all been kicking off, wouldn't we? No, not after the way he was out like that. I, I thought it was a bit generous. To be well, Carl, to be fair to Groves, when Frotch were interviewed afterwards, he didn't even know what round, what round it were, did he? Or something. I think Carl did. He yeah, he, what, what, he, he was like, "Did I get put down?" So, yeah, yeah he like, got put, put down. down. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe, maybe they could have left Groves fighting that, but they kept him in for because he had concussion. Because they were going to keep in Groves. Now, a lot of people forget that and Eddie Earn didn't want that out because they wanted to build rematch up 
No, look, we all know what happened, don't we? Froch ended up with 10 million quid fucking gross and all and that. Ju- and, and, and George slipped in the in the second fight. Well, Gro- George Groves left in an ice cream van like Dennis Hobson's dad when he passed away, sadly. Groves ended up knocked out, then he cold, then he was smoked. I think I, th- I think he slipped. Like, if you look at the way he fell, there was water in the ring. I don't know. Listen, Listen. Groves got cobra he got cobra mate. End of story. And uh, Carl's mum jumped in the ring and she walked up to him and she said, it is what it is. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> so, so, look, end of the day, they're never going to be best mates, are they? But it was a part of British boxing that we all, we're all going to remember, aren't we, for the rest of our lives. Do you know what I mean? It's, it, it's this weird thing, Russ. It was almost like this really intense rivalry that came from nowhere, happened, and then died off. Like, like it was like the space of like six or seven months of just intense dislike and rivalry, and then it just seemed to disappear. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you something. Let's back up a little bit. The first time they sparred, they had sixteen ounce gloves on. Froch put him out cold. That's the true story. Groves, to be fair to him and Adam Bove, they flew up to Nottingham three weeks later, or oh, and. Groves put it on Frotch, didn't drop him, but he had the better of the session. Frotch fought Boote. When he knocked Boote out, Adam Booth and Groves were in the crowd. Everybody were cheering, and Groves was sat there with a face like stone, old stone face. And I think that's that's where the rival were, because Groves had had a good session in the second spa, and he thought... I can beat him, but look what he's just done to Boote, who was considered the man money at the time. So no, no, no James the Gale was considered the man at the time. Yo, man, why are you throwing James the Gale at me? Groves beat the Gale twice, amateur and pro. Frotch knocked Groves out twice, so how can you throw James the Gale at me? I, I think a prime James the Gale plays with Carl. You're talking uh, about probably money. drops him. That's got 11 elite wins, and J- J- James DeGale's got how many elite wins? Three. And, and, no, who, and the gold whoa, medal. whoa, 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 whoa. Boutte and Darrell lost their zeros to Carl Frotch. So when DeGale beat them, right, they would already been beat by the Cobra. The Cobra got there first. Groves beat the man that DeGale couldn't beat. So don't throw that DeGale, DeGale swerve ball at Why didn't Carl fight him then? He retired, didn't he? I mean, there's well, always well, yeah. somebody else. What about after him? Is he going to fight Callum Smith when he's 40? Should have done. He's on and on, well, hasn't yeah. he? Yeah, yeah. He, he ducked everyone. Listen, Carl ducked everyone. You're inspiring Callum Smith. And Callum Smith's very amateurish and very upright. And he couldn't survive. Wait, 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 hold on. Why didn't he fight Paul Smith? Now, now let's get back to serious business here, Ross. Well, he didn't fight Paul, Paul Smith. Smith. Yeah, they had the offer from Dennis, but it didn't work out. Nah. Scared. Paul Smith shouldn't even be mixed to fight Carl Frotch. His best win's Tony Dodson. Let's have it right, Terry. Dodson would have beaten <clears throat> Frotch. Hey? Dodson would have beaten Frotch. Easy. Dodson would have beaten Frotch. Frotch knocked him out inside three rounds. What plan are you trying to try? Nah, he slipped. He slipped again, hey. Russ, man. Like, hey, it seems to happen a lot with Carl. Let's talk serious. Right, let's move on from this. Because every <laughs> time I mention Cobra's name, you start throwing swerve balls at me. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get you up to Sheffield one night and I'm going to ring Carl up and I'm going to get him there and I'm going to get him to grip you. <laughs> please do. Oh, please. Leaf, Roch, the renovator to see you off. Right. Um, Coaching, Terry. Are we now, yes. oh, Are we seeing a lot of trainers winging it and not wanting to learn their craft? For example, Ben Davidson jumped in with Tyson Fury. He was an understudy for Mark Tibbs and Jimmy Tibbs. He jumped in with Tyson Fury. Tyson's dropped him, obviously. He's with Billy Joe. Is Billy Joe about to drop him? Watch the watch it all unfold. Uh, will Josh Taylor drop him? Will that be free? Well, will that be an attrick of people dropping him? What what's going on there? And is he the only one that's trying to jump in with these Instagram videos? These chats on IFL, I mean, I've, I've found it here. He's been in 67 IFL videos on YouTube, Ben Davidson. Google it. It's all there on analytics. 
67 interviews on IFL alone, not to mention Boxing Social, Behind the Gloves, you know, the, the usual click. He's ben, da ben Davidson's a bit of a baby, isn't he? I mean, if you look at him, he, sh he looks like he should still be in school, shouldn't he? Is, he? is this how boxing's going and are too many people not wanting to learn the craft? What do you think? Okay, God, this is... This is a really complex one, Russ, so you got to bear with me. Uh, this is one that you can get your teeth into. So teaching someone to box is incredibly easy. I don't care what anyone tells you. Like, like it's easy. Like, it's not like fucking having to hang doors and put skirting boards up in dado rails and coving and stuff. That's real work. Teaching someone to box is pretty easy. Now, teaching someone to be a world champion is a lot harder. That's the bit that gets incredibly hard, Russ. And that's where people fall down. Yeah. Now, Ben Davidson, we'll use him as an example. I think Ben's a good young trainer. I think he's on his way up. But Ben's essentially known for being an analyst, right? So Ben just watches loads of video and tells you what people's habits are. That, that's one part of boxing, and I get that. Can he make decisions in real time? Can he make changes in real time? Can he read what's going on in real time and go, actually, the plan we had isn't working. Let's switch to a plan B. Yeah. I haven't seen that yet. Now, if we, if we then stretch that out, when you work with someone day in, day out, the role of a trainer is to find different ways to train the same thing. Yeah. That's, that's, that's how you stop boxers getting bored. That's how you keep boxers interested in you. You've always got to be adding fresh ideas and fresh things without trying to move away from the basics. You still need a great jab. You still need good footwork. You still need to make good decisions. They're the bits that, you know, that's how you earn your money. Yeah. And I think what's happened is a lot of guys have gone, do you know what? I look good on Instagram doing pad work. I'm now going to train fighters because I can do really good pads. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. But how are you going to get a fighter from 185 pounds down to 160 and keep them fresh enough that they can fight on fight night? Yeah. What are you going to do when your fighter keeps getting hit by a jab to the body he doesn't see? What are you going to do when, when a guy keeps fainting and drawing his lead and countering straight off that? What are you going to do when your fighter's in a bad way because his girlfriend's just left him and he's got bills to pay? All of these things that constitute coaching aren't pad work. And a lot of guys struggle at that because really good coaches are good managers, Russ. And what they do is they get you to the start line in your best possible shape. That's it. Right? My role as a coach is to get you on a start line in your best possible shape where you're comfortable with the guy you're fighting and you know what you have to do. Now, the rest is up to the guy. Yeah. So if you show up and you're overweight, if you show up and you're tired, that's my fault. If you can't jab, that's my fault. If you can't move your feet, that's my fault. Yeah. What about that kid, who, that Xavier Miller? Do you think that he's not learned his craft to be jumping in with a pay-per-view fighter like Dylan White? I don't think it's that, Russ. It's Xavier Miller cut his teeth as Don Charles is kind of, yeah, he was mentored by Don Charles. But Xavier Miller is more known as an amateur coach than a pro coach. Yeah. And the thing is, amateur is pretty simple because it's all about fair play and, you know, you know, a bit of equality. But in the pros, like, you've got to know about the dark arts, you know. Are you checking the ring? Are you checking the changing rooms? Are you checking all the small details that could throw your fighter off? Yes or no? And a lot of people don't know how to do that. They know how to do all the, the physical stuff, but not that sort of stuff. Yeah. Are you making sure the hotel's correct? Are you making sure the hotel's the right distance away from all these small things that the opposition could do to you to throw you off your game? Are you, are you watching those? That's why Shane McGuigan had Jimmy Tibbs in his corner, as I say often. You need someone who's just seen all the dark arts and can go, no, nah, mate, don't let them do that to you. Yeah, I think that uh, Ben Davison will do all right, but I just personally think that I want to see him be judged on taking kids to British titles and English in, in, English titles and stuff like that, mate. I, I don't want to yeah. uh, just jump in with world champions because it's like cutting corners, isn't it? But look, it's, with someone like a Josh Taylor, it's easy. Josh is already elite. He understands what it is. Already to be. elite, isn't it? Fury and Billy Joe—they're already elite, aren't they? Yeah, 
take a kid, take a kid from debut, and then turn him in league. It's like Frank Lampard has took Chelsea on, hasn't he? But he's only done a year at Derby. They won, no, they didn't get promoted, but he's got Chelsea job because he played for Chelsea. But how many years are they going to put up with Lampard there? before? Because he's not going to win the title, is he? He'll be gone in two years. Yeah, exactly. He'll be gone in two years and he'll leave with 30 million. Yeah, that's some nice work you've been getting. You know, then he'll be a pundit. So they've got it all figured out, haven't they? All right, then. Uh, move. Uh, oh, obviously. Uh, do you think that Mark. Uh, sorry, I'm not. Uh, what's it called? What's, what's his name? Ben Davidson. Do you think that Ben Davidson will do anything with Isaac Lowe? Well, if he can, if he can teach Isaac Lowe to spell, that'll be a that'll be a big victory, my friend. I mean, his tweets are an absolute nightmare to read. So let's start with that. But Isaac's on a good gig. As long as Tyson boxes, Isaac boxes. It doesn't even matter, really. Isaac's just cool. He's Do you think cool. Isaac Lowe will end up with a contract with Gillette Sensor Gel? <laughs> think he'll be a Gillette Sensor Gel model. I uh, no. <laughs> oh. All right then. Will that be harsh that on Isaac Lowe? Will I get loads of problems now for Isaac? I don't know. Lowe? I like Isaac. I just think yeah, he's just one of those characters, isn't he? I remember uh, hearing rumor that Isaac Lowe tried to put it on Josh Whalen sparring and then got bladdered. Going back a few years, that's a true story. Right then. Uh, moving on, Anthony Joshua and Dylan White now. Joshua's been over a decade up at the EIS, the best facilities, the best nutrition, the best coaches, Olympic athletes train up there. But Anthony Joshua can't do 12 rounds. Dylan White, he's another guy with stamina issues. Carl uh, Froch and Tyson Fury, Huey Fury, they do 20 rounds in the sleep. Why is that? Are they fighting loose and not exerting energy? And are the others going flat out? Or is there stamina issues in certain boxers at elite level? So stamina issues are relative, porky, right? And I'll, I'll explain what I mean. If, if I put you in the ring with Dillian White, yeah. how long do you reckon you're going to last? One minute. Okay. I put you in the ring with Steffi Bull, how long do you reckon you're going to last? I'll choke him out. Uh, I don't know. Uh, he he won't last long with me, would he? If he? In a boxing ring? Oh, I don't know. Probably, I probably if, if we boxed, I've had this conversation yeah. today. If I boxed him, it, it probably he's going to last longer. Than, we're going to go full six round of job. We're going to do six three minute yeah. rounds. But in a proper fight, I'm just going to take him down and choke him out. Yeah. And, and so that's what I mean. So the amount of stamina you have is relative to your level of stress. Yeah, so yeah. if you're highly stressed, you're going to empty your tank quicker just because you're thinking about more things and half of them aren't even relevant to the fight. And I think that might be Joshua's problem and that might be Dillian's problem. You so look at that... guys like... Yeah, go on, sorry. Go on. So if you look at guys like Huey, Tyson, I, uh, Carl to an extent... Well, are they Iceman then? They don't bother them. They're just... Are they, are they not phased by the occasion and things like that? You know, nervous energy. They're lifelong boxers, so they're comfortable... So you can't say to Carl, oh, yeah, Carl, you're going to fight a guy 15 pounds heavier than you. It's not going to bother him. He's done it when he was a kid. He's like, yeah, I know. Same with Huey, same with Tyson. Yeah, but so, how was Huey sparring for like 80 minutes with different people? For well, Crotch, same, and, and Tyson, and they're not tired. Why is that? Like I said, their stress level's a lot lower. They're comfortable in there. Yeah. There's nothing in there they haven't seen before. Yeah. So what does that make? What, I mean? what does that make Joshua and Dylan White? Are they not as comfortable? Well, they can't be because they're still trying to figure out what the hell this thing called boxing is. They know what they they know what they're being told to do, but when you have got a guy in front of you like an Andy Ruiz or a Povetkin, and it all looks different, and you have no thinking time, you end up in this spiral of stress, Russ, where you're like the the panic goes up and up, and you can see it in Joshua. He starts breathing faster. You know, he starts retreating to the ropes when he doesn't know what he should be doing. Mm. Dillian does something similar. They all do. And it's not that they're not fit, because they are fit. And if you looked at their numbers in the gym, 
or just any kind of fitness measure, they'd be just as fit as Tyson Fury. Oh. But what they haven't built up is that mental picture of how a fight should go. So they can't, there's a lot of stuff that they can't do subconsciously, which Tyson and Fury can do subconsciously. Yeah. And that's the big difference. Yeah, I've seen I've seen you spar loads of us. Uh, you know the the world the the glory world champion from uh, UFC is it, uh, is it kickboxing Rico Verhoeven? Rico Verhoeven. Yeah, I think him. I think Rico Verhoeven, Tom Aspinall, and there's some other guy that I've met. That they're like probably the most scariest man I've ever met in my life, but. I've seen Rico. But, I've seen you spar them, but uh, they, but they're not boxers. Yeah, they're not boxers. Yeah, and and they can they can you can keep throwing them in the ring with you, and they'll just keep racking look, rounds up like it's note. I, I, look, I'll take four lads up there. He won't be doing twenty rounds, guaranteed. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Because they'll offer him a different level of stress, and it's not that he's any less fit. It's that. We will make him work for more seconds of every round than Rico. It's the stress and not the cardio then that makes them tire, is it? Yes, of course. I spoke to, I, I forgot who I spoke to about this, but I spoke to a guy at a show once. I forgot his name, but he said to me, he, he asked me if I, if I did any other sports. This is a while ago. This, I said, well, I, I did it. I tried a bit of canoeing at Friber Country. And judo. Judo many years ago when I was a teenager. But I'm talking recently, you know, like four or five years ago. I did a bit of canoeing yeah. and he said, did you ever tip over in the canoe? And I said, well, yeah. He said, what happened? I said, well, they come flying out, don't they, on a boat, you know, to get you back upright. He said, how did you feel? I said, well, when it happened, I, I, I was like really stressed. Do you know what I mean? And he said, how long can you hold your head underwater? I said, well, what do you mean? Like when I were in the canoe or when I, if I'm in bath at home? I can hold my head under, a minute underwater in bath, but when I was in that canoe, he said, I, I, could, I were 10, 15 seconds and I were nearly done. That's because of the stress levels, isn't it? It's like if a crocodile yeah. takes you down, you're done after six or seven seconds because of stress levels. But if you put your head in the sink in bath at home, you can do a minute, can't you? Because you're not stressed, are you? Exactly. And is that the point you're trying to make? Regarding yeah. the the stress levels. Yeah. Like, Fitness is oh all my about God, context. He's punching me, he's punching me, he's really on me here, and your stress levels are really up. But if you're relaxed and you're fighting loose, because you and Tyson always seem to fight loose, don't they? They never seem to be stressed out or in bother or anything. Is that more to do with do we have to give more credit to Peter Fury for training them? Obviously, obviously Peter don't hasn't trained Tyson for a few, few you know, but but does Peter get credit for you not being as stressed and fighting loose, or is it just the person? What do you think? So, if you look at how the Furies box, they shut down the variables, right? So they stand really narrow. They don't, they don't even give you a big target. They stand really narrow, and yeah. they're good with their jab, right? Yeah. So they just shut down your options. And that gives them time, because they're like, well, right now you can only really hit me with a jab. Yeah. And so they buy yeah. themselves time to have a look, to think, but they're good on their feet. So they know that they can't stay in the same place. Yeah. So they have a little look. If nothing's on, they move on. They have another look. If there's something on, take it. If there's not, move on. And so that means you can be quite economical because it's the other guy that has to work hard to get at you. So if that's Peter, kudos to Peter for, for being able to deliver that because it just gives you an extra fifth or third of a second to just have a look and figure out what's going on in the fight. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's interesting. That that's interesting. So basically, it don't mean you can go to the gym. You can put all them hours in on treadmill, cross trainer, do all that running and all that, and be super fit. But you can get in that ring on the night, and you can lose all your energy inside two rounds. Oh, can, Russ, if you're you know, stressed. So I'll tell you a story, Russ. Right, it I was. remember once. I came in from work on a Friday, right? Walked into Fitzroy Lodge and there was a guy hitting the bag. He's hitting the bag. I think he, in the time it took me to get ready, he hit, he'd done five rounds on the bag and you could hear the bag popping. I was like, God, that guy looks decent. And Mick Carney was like, can you do three rounds with it? I meant, 
I haven't even warmed up yet. I'm like, okay, can I just have a minute to warm up? Going. Guy's, what, 6'4", six, 6'5", six, ripped. I've seen him on the bag, and he looks like he knows what the hell he's doing. So I'm like, God help me. So all I've done is I've just gone in low, Russ, touched his forehead, literally just taking the piss, touched his forehead, ripped a shot to the body. Yeah? And I knew it hurt him. I was like, okay, cool. Moved around, moved around, just threw a backhand to his chest, right on his breastbone. And I was like, he doesn't like it. He really doesn't like this. And about two minutes in, he was just, he was just leaning on the ropes, man, just uh, gasping for air, all of that. And this guy was an Olympic gold medalist in the rowing. Yeah. He shows you, you can be fit. And he was, he was super fit. But when that pressure came on and he didn't know how to deal with it, and every time he kept trying to find a solution, he was getting hurt. Yeah. Everything just drains out of you. And your body just says, play dead. Yeah, look for, looking for a way out. Yeah, because you're like, well, this, this might not be the thing for me. That's why you have to be very, very careful when people first come into a boxing gym. You want to pitch the sparring at the right level so you don't just force them into panic mode. You want to make sure that they get a few shots off to get a bit of confidence. And then, then you could kind of put the pressure on later on. But don't have them on the defensive from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing, that stamina thing. So you can do your six-mile runs in the morning in 35 minutes like the Cobra. You can do, you can do your, your, your cross-trainer. You can do all that. And you can, but yet you could still gas after three rounds if your stress levels are too much, if somebody's coming at you, throwing big bombs, and you're like, <sighs> your heartbeat's gonna, like, when I tipped upside down in that canoe, that guy said to me, oh, you, your heartbeat would have been beating faster than when your head's under water in bath because you're stressed. So I agree with what you said there. It's it's all about your your mental attitude, I suppose. Is it, men, is it more mental than anything? For example, yeah. Roy Jones, was saying that he wasn't fit back in the day, but he could do 12 rounds better when he were older than he could when he were younger. I, I, how does that make sense? Because he understands what he's doing a lot more. Yeah, is that what it is? Yeah. Is that what you teach yeah. your fighters, Terry? That comes to experience. So we put them in really hard situations early on. Not, not situations that will scare them, but situations where it's like, look, you're doing well at this do more of it. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And we keep doing that week after week, year after year. So when you're put in a tough situation in the ring, you're comfortable. You're like, no, I've been here before. I can do this. Just stick to what I know. Start with the jab. Bam. Oh, it landed. Cool. Do it again. Bam. Oh, it still landed. Okay. And at that time, you're just doing two jabs. You're just helping empty the other guy's tank and you're building yours up. It's just, it's that simple, man. Years ago, I asked Frotch, I said, I might have a bit of beef with this guy. What's, what, what do you suggest and all that? Because I, I, I think you know what I'm on about. And he said, just smile. I said, why? He said, because if you smile and relax, you, you're not going to get stressed. But if you're like, you know, like when you're a kid and somebody says, I'll see you at quarter to four at gate. And they're telling you at dinner time, you're like... When you get to quarter to four, your heart's beating like no, you know, as a ten-year-old, and you're you and you've got no energy. It's nervous energy. And Carl said to me, "Just, just got to relax and just smile, just smile." You know, don't say the kid's name when we're on about here, but you, you just got to smile and relax, and you don't. So that stress thing, what you said there, it's just confirmed it for me. It's all, I think it's like it's all mental, isn't it, Terry? Yeah, the Marines do the same thing. So the Marines, before a mission, um, all form, the Marine Special Forces, they all go through this thing where they, they breathe slow and they lower their heart rate before a mission. And they just get into this habit of breathing. and They, they start breathing in sync and they slow it all down and it relaxes them and they smile and they sing sometimes. And they do all of these things. Yeah. And then when it's time to execute, they just do it. Bam. All right, then. Uh... Let's have a look what we've got now. Did I love that we thought this was going to be a short one. Yeah, I know. Yeah, did Bentley beat Efron? 
Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. You know I'm a big fan. Denzel Bentley is so much better than Mark Heffron. Denzel Be- and, uh, and I'll tell you what it is, Russ. And people won't know this unless they've worked with Denzel. He has, a, he has like one of the hardest punches of any middleweight. I can't explain it any other way, Russ. It's, he hits like a cruiserweight. And what he does, which is really good, it's all knuckle. There's no finger in his punching. It's all knuckles. So Heffron was taking some heavy artillery until Denzel got tired. I think that was it. Like Denz, I think the occasion might have got to him a bit. And I think in the rematch, he stops Mark Heffron. Mm. He does. He, just, he, he will stop him. And that's no disrespect to Mark. I like Mark. I think Mark's been good for British boxing. Mark just doesn't strike me as a guy that took boxing seriously. Well, as serious as you should at that kind of level. Yeah. Whereas Denzel does. Do you think that Mark Efron's, you know, before Liam Williams beat him, he was obviously 21 and 0. Do you think that 13 and 0 of them had losing record? And do you think that's the wrong way to go? Because Selfa Barrett, I think he, before he got done, he'd beat, or Selfa Barrett currently at the moment beat guys with 16 losing records. Do you think that these sort of guys are trying to get padded records and hope that Eddie Earn rings them or Frank? Is that way boxing is going and the fighters are not learning the craft? Because nobody's okay. going to be going the, the, the traditional route for belts, Terry, do they? So, so let's look at Denzel Bentley. Denzel fought Mark Heffron after, what, 12, 13 fights? Yeah, and I had him down to get hammered. But I, did, yeah, I, I, I had Liam Williams to get iced, didn't I? Yeah, I, I messaged Denzel on the Saturday and I said, I actually think if you, if you execute some of the stuff we've been talking about, I think you stop this guy in six rounds. And I, I knew what punch would stop Heffron. The right uppercut would have stopped Mark Heffron in that fight if Denzel had just planted it and just gone, bam, he would have stopped Mark Heffron yeah. easily. He, he's, I'm not going to say he's special. I don't think we want to put that kind of pressure on Denzel yet. Denzel's definitely British level. He's definitely European. And then world level depends on who's there at the time. But he, he can really do it. And so you have to respect the guy who takes on Heffron after 13 fights. Because yeah. Mark's been a pro for 10 years. Do you remember when I started yeah. with Dennis and he said, draw a list up? Oh, you yeah. think I should sign? He was my number one, wasn't he? Yeah, but you, you liked how he looked. Yeah, you, you, yeah. Fell for, you fell for the looks. And I see Valley said, no, 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 don't, don't, don't sign him, he, he'll not go all the way. And I was like, what are you on about, man? He's knocking people out. But when you delved behind the scenes and looked at his record, he, he, he were knocking out guys that were, that shouldn't have been in ring one. So, and I think Russ, people look at the, go on, sorry. So if you look at this weekend of boxing, right? Uh, Two people I consider friends, Denzel Bentley and Umar Sadiq. Roll the dice. What about Umar Sadiq, Terry, don't you? Do you pass? He is, but I'm going to ask you a question. How many guys in under 15 fights would have fought Fedor Chudinov? No, not many would they? No. And, and was the winning on the scorecards. The managers wouldn't have let him go near him, would they? Yeah. So Umar rolls the dice. He's winning on the scorecards, but he was honest enough to say, round 12, I had nothing in the tank. Yeah. And, but, but look, look, but this is the point, Russ. When I spoke to Uma, what I said to him was, at least you found out, A, the things you're really good at, and B, the things you're really bad at. But you needed an opponent this good There's to find out. There's from that fight for, for uh, Uma, isn't there? For both. For, and Denzel as well. I think both guys will grow a lot from this fight, as opposed to fighting another Lithuanian and padding out your record. Do you think, Terry, that uh, a, lot, a lot of us, me included, we tend to look at a physique of a fighter and not underneath. For example, people were critical before my time about Larry Holmes, Tyson Fury, Clinton Woods, Tony Bellew, and they all surprised us. And yet we looked at, do you remember the guy that Lennox Lewis beat? Michael, what was the guy? The guy? Mora. No, Mora? no, Lennox Michael Lewis. Michael Grant. Michael Grant, he was another Anthony Joshua, wasn't he? 31 Six and foot seven, 
Yeah. Six foot seven, mate, chiseled, chiseled out of concrete. And he, he folded like a marshmallow, didn't he? Do you remember that lad, Gerald Washington? Yeah, I remember him. Yeah, yeah. He was yeah. You know, another muscle head. Yeah, another well, you know, Russ, folded like a deck you, there, didn't he? He got cut down like got, cheese. Yeah. I, I look when I look at boxers, my first question is, can you actually box? Yeah. If you can, you get a big tick. My second one is, can you make decisions in the middle of a fight? That's another big tick. Third, do you live this every day? Is this your profession? Another big tick. If you tick those three, I'll genuinely back you to go a long way. Because, and so something Anthony Yard and Tunde said in their post-fight interview I thought was interesting, where they just said, this is our job. We're in the gym every day. Because what else would a professional boxer be doing apart from being in the gym? Do you know what I mean? That's part of what you get paid for. Be in the gym, be in shape, learn your craft. And then you get the reward that you get to fight for a world title further down the line. Like, all these guys who, who kind of train and then stop, I'm like, it's ridiculous. There's no reason to. Yeah, do you think that Clinton Woods would have had more sponsors if he'd have had the... Eubank physique instead of the Clinton Woods physique. You know, Clintons tend to look like Larry Holmes and Bellew, didn't he? Tyson Fury. I but, feel. but we're not but we're not saying that Clinton Woods couldn't fight because he fought from Roy Jones to Cloud. He fought seven years at the highest level and made millions of pounds. But do you think that yeah. if Clinton would have looked differently, do you think that Dennis would have had more sponsorship deals for him? No, nah, I just think Clinton was one of those guys who he well, had to look the way he did. Knackers, yeah. No, 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 but he, he had to look that way because it helped sell the fight. You got this, you got this kind of soft looking, pale English guy fighting Roy Jones, fighting Tava, fighting Glenn Johnson. And you'd look at the two and go, God, he's going to get absolutely minced. And then he'd suddenly show that he's got the heart of a lion. I thought I was absolutely perfect. Yeah, Clinton's the type of kid like that or go, do, go fight Roy Jones and then go back and go for a pint. Is he like the Tony Simpson, isn't he? He'll go back and have a pint with his mates in local and then go to Chippy. You know, he, he <laughs> no airs and graces and jump and go do a bit of plastering the day after. And this is why he's loved by that many people, you see, because there's no airs and graces, is there? But... As regards the, you heard what Clinton said when I did that interview with him that he could never understand why people pack the jobs in because fighting's only two hours a day training, morning and night. That's it. So why would you want to pack your job in? Too yeah. many, see where I'm coming from? If yeah. you're too many people in Clinton's eyes, they go to the gym, but they're attending the gym, they're not training. As soon as he gets out of that car and goes in that gym, his session starts. And the sooner it's done, the sooner you get out of that gym, innit, don't you? You don't need to stand there talking knackers, do you, to people about who's been doing this or who's said this. Too many fighters, and, I, and fighters who are watching this, let me tell you this, I know loads of gyms that watch my channel. Yeah, you're all watching, aren't you? Well, let me tell you this. How many of you fighters that are watching me now have been in your gym this morning Talking bollocks about who said what on Twitter and social media. Forget that. Get your sessions done. Is that well, all? Is it, oh, am I so it, saying that? It, it, so I think, I think it works two ways, Russ. So if you're new to the sport, I want you to just be in the gym. I want you to soak it all up, right? Because I want you to fall in love with the sport because that will make you train harder. So I think you do that. I think when you're elite, and you're coming in for very focused and specific things, I'd rather you come in, do your shit, go and have a nap straight away. Oh. That's, that's how I look at it. That's how you want to manage it. But like these young guys, these amateurs or guys who are under 10 fights in, you should be in the gym all the time, soaking things in, watching how people do stuff, learning, just immersing yourself in boxing. Yeah. Yeah, it's... it's, it's uh... It's very interesting that that part of the conversation, but 
I just think that there's too many fighters attend the gym and they're not training, mate. They're just sat talking knackers. Yeah, some of them might observe. I, I, I go up to Glen Road Gym. I see uh, Sam Sheedy there. He, he's training people now and doing PTI training. Sam, if he's not working with a customer, he'll sit and observe and he, he's soaking it all up. And I think he's a good trainer in the making, Sam, and I've got a lot of time for him. Yeah. Other people will sit there, they're chatting about Twitter. Sonny Edwards, he's got more to say about social media than his own training session. What's all that about? Do you know? Oh. They, they all get found out in the end because when you get to that top level, Russ, you find out who put the work in. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, Anthony Yard against Dex Spellman. What do you think to that? I thought it was good for Yard to get the rounds in. He was always going to stop Spellman. Was it um, a good stoppage? I think so because Yard hadn't even hit top gear yet. He was only going to get worse. He was only in second. Year one of yard, really. Yeah, yeah, and let's not forget that four weeks ago, like, or before longer, he just fought Lyndon Arthur. So, you know, how much punishment do you want a guy to take? Yeah. Does Anthony Yard beat Lyndon Arthur? I, I say yes so. by KO. Yeah, there's loads. Well, and I like, I like Lyndon. Will we, put, will we be putting 50 quid on Yard to beat Spellman by KO? I think I will. Yeah. So worth for 50 quid, you get your 50 back plus profit. It's free money, isn't it? Exactly. Uh, okay, then what, there weren't really much else to comment on Frank's show. I think they were just making the numbers up the other fights. Uh, so, do we agree that Mark Efron's found his level? No, no, I think Mark, I think Mark can elevate. It's about how bad he wants it, though. I think Mark could, could win in English and fight for a British, but he has to want it now. For the next two years, He's got to live it. If he doesn't want to do that, cool. Then he'll just be an enhancement talent for all these guys coming up. Yeah. Uh, John Rawlins has, has had loads of criticism on social media. He was actually trend, trending the other night after the fight. Uh, is the bias now out of control from TV networks? Do the, uh, and do they have a meeting before the fight to say, big this guy up, and if this guy's getting hit by this other guy, say he's got a great chin, but don't big the other guy up. Is it now out of control? Um, I don't know how controversial I can be on this one, Porky. But I've had loads of hammering since Dylan White, though, aren't they? The bias, the bias. And I'd like to think that, I'm one of the cheer, not the cheerleader. I'm whatever I've done. I've rocked the boat regarding Johnny Nelson's apology over the lucky punch that they said that Povetkin threw. Yeah, I, I, I went maybe over the top. Johnny Nelson, to his credit, Johnny Massive Horse Cock Nelson has come out and said he apologizes for saying that Povetkin threw a lucky punch. But what made him say that? He admitted that maybe he were biased towards the guy, but if they're admitting that they're biased towards the guy, are they being told to be like that? And is it out of control? And is John Rawlins out of control? Because I think that Johnny Nelson and John Rawlins need to fuck off. Get on Dole. Can, can, can I be honest with you? Go on, yeah. I think in John Rawlings' ideal world, every card is Mark Heffron versus Mark Heffron. Yeah. John Rawling will only ever applaud those sorts of guys. That, that's what he likes. He, he's not a guy, he doesn't like people who are skillful. And I'm trying, to, I'm trying to stay away from controversial words here, but he doesn't like people who are slick. He doesn't like people who move. He doesn't like people, people who have skill. He likes we can't swear, you know. It. We can't swear now, you know, because of course I've sworn we don't get half one pound fifty foot video. <laughs> No, um, I, don't, I don't even want to swear. I don't want to swear. I just think John me Rawling. Angry. Ah, John Rawling. John Rawling commentates differently for black fighters who are winning than he does for white fighters who are winning. Yeah. That's all I want to say. Yeah, that yeah. upsets me. You know, um, I think John Rawling I, is black fighters a hard time. Yes, a hundred percent. 
I don't want to make this about race, but a lot of people are saying that John Rawlin, John Rawlins, is against black fighters. I don't, I don't, but I don't want to make it about race. But I haven't seen that. But a lot of people are saying that in my emails and stuff like that. Yeah. So what you find with John Rawlin, right, is and the Bentley Heffron fight was an example. If you'd been tuning into that, mm. and I don't know, was it Rawlin who did that? Probably. If you've been tuning into that, you'd have thought Denzel was taking a shellacking. But if you watch it, I, I want. Yeah, yeah. Ozzy Smith, uh, right. Smith said he was looking at it and he thought, "What? What?" And, and I were watching and I thought, "I, I, what's going on here? What's going on here? Yeah. Am I watching the same fight? I watched highlights, but am I watching yeah. the same fight?" So, so, so what I'd do is I'd turn the sound off. And then I'd watch it because we were watching it across two screens in the same living room. So I'd watch it and I'm like, no, no, Denzel's okay here. He's okay. He's a bit tired, but he's got this under control. Oh, there, he's counting. He's counting. And then I turned the commentator, commentary back on. And then Roy like, oh, good effort by Heffron. And then Denzel would hit him with the right hand and it would just go quiet. And it'd be, oh, Heffron come back with a jab. I'm like, no, no, no. What about that right hand Denzel threw? Yeah. Just, and look. He's from that world. I don't care what anyone says. Frank Warren is from that world of smoky, working men's clubs where you're meant to defend every punch with your face and it's all about balls and bottle and all of these, these, these things that just get you knocked out at the top level. And so all of these guys are like that. Bunts is like that. All of them are like, they always associate black people when they box. Oh, he's just flash. There's no substance to it. And I'm tired of that. You know, give people their credit, whoever they are, just give them their credit for, for actually being able to do what they do. And Rawling is just a relic. Like, this, he should, that's the guy we should be getting rid of. Rawling um, on BT Sport, get rid of Bunce as well. That Paul Bunce Dempsey. You can't get rid of Bunce. Get Woodall. Like him. Nah, Bunce is an anachronism as well. I like Bunce. So let's get some guys in. Like, Alex Arthur's one of my favorite. Like pundits in boxing, Alex Arthur, I think. Well, good. that's why Sky won't have Alex Arthur on, will they? Because he tells the truth, doesn't he? Yeah. Alex Arthur, Glenn McCrory, I'll be all right Jamie with Moore it. tells the truth, doesn't he? Jamie Moore's decent as well. Frotch, Frotch told the truth about uh, Joshua saying he got beat by a fat Mexican and he hadn't showed him anything since, he beat, since the Saudi fight because he was gun shy on IFL and Coogan filmed it. But. Uh, Frotch thought it was just a chat. He didn't know it was being filmed. Put it out there, and we know what's happened since then. Frotch, well, we haven't seen Frotch on Sky, have we? So, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it's a temporary ban. And they, yeah, they ho hopefully it it's a temporary. Hopefully they're not having. They'll have him out soon, but yeah. Or maybe, maybe Carl Frotch. Maybe it could be because of the. the uh, Virus. I don't. I don't know. But Carl Frotch is like the Roy Keane of boxing punditry, and he always goes against the grain, doesn't he? And that's not going to go down well at Sky, is it? No, but the fans love it. That's what. That's what we want on our pay per views. We want. That's what we're paying twenty quid for. Yeah. A bit of honesty. Five quid, isn't it, on Joshua fights? Oh Jesus! Plus subscription. Ah, oh, right. I mean, how can they get away with this, Teddy, for this long? Because people keep paying. Yeah, and, and how do we get fans to not keep paying for Sky? Do we tell them to just go to VIPbox.com and get a free stream? I mean, are they illiterate? If you want to get rid of Sky, go to VIPbox.com. It's a free stream. It's not rocket science. Ooh! <laughs> People keep paying for Sky Boxing, like pay per views. Go to VIPbox.com. It's free. But they don't listen but do you to know what, Russ? Market, do People want to pay. And they want to pay because they want to feel involved in the story. They want to feel that they've been part of every step. Yeah, I paid. Yeah, exactly. to sit down. You know, it, it's an ego thing. It's not even a common sense. It's just an ego thing. Yeah, yeah. I've had a relative of mine come running up to me saying, How do you have a selfie with me at a boxing show? I can't wait for the next show. I says, Get out of my house. <laughs> you 
get out of my house now. You know what I mean? I mean, Jesus. He went, oh, get out. Go now while you can. I'll kill you. No, I just think that Pete, uh, you've got to give Eddie Earn credit. He's played it to a T. He works the room at the shows, didn't he? I once saw him at a show at Sheffield and I looked at him. I was watching him because obviously he lives in my head, doesn't he? Rent free. I was watching him walk around and he must have shook about 500 hands. And they're going to tell everybody, aren't they, about that? And I thought, yeah. and the show was so shite. It was unbelievable. We had Brian Rose as chief support, Kel Brooks and Chenko. And I said to my kid's mum at the time, I said, what are we doing? She says, let's go. We end up in a curry house on uh, on Attercliffe, the big stone building. I forgot what it's called. It wasn't far from there. We, ended, we, we didn't even see Kel's fight. The show were that pony. All I remember is screaming my head off drunk, Seaside Air, Seaside Air for Brian Rose because it was a split decision, but I thought he got beat anyway, but he got the nod on an Eddie Earn show. But I thought, I'm watching him. I thought, yeah, I'm watching you. You're working room. And what he were doing were bigging himself up more than the fucking show. But it worked because then people, they're, they're in the palm of his hand then. And I said to Dennis, you need to do what he's doing, Dennis. He goes, what do you mean? I says, you need to start going round, making a fuss of everybody so they come back again. And you know what Dennis is like. He's like Mick Hennessy. You can't reach him, can you? You no, don't get Warren make doing that, do you? Frank Warren, Dennis, and Mick Hennessy, compared to Eddie Earn, they're dinosaurs, aren't they? They don't get it, do they? They're good at shows to have their seat and that, that. They don't need to go round making a fuss of everybody, but Eddie Earn, he wants to be famous, doesn't he? Dennis, done, yeah. Dennis is not on social media. It's Michelle who puts the tweets out in the office. Uh, Mick Hennessy don't put his tweets out. His secretary puts them out. I forgot, uh, I forgot her name, but she's a woman. And Frank Warren, I don't think Frank works it. I think it's, a, is it George or somebody else who works it? They're relics, aren't they? But the old school. They'll still be here when Joshua retires and Eddie Earn's gone. They'll still be here. And we all remember when Chris Schubank Sr. went. Barry Earn went, didn't he? Because yeah. they're accountants. Accountant by name, accountant by nature. But Dennis, Mick and Frank, the other three, they'll still be here, won't they? But I was watching him that night and I've watched him at a few other shows and I thought, he's got it off to a T, hasn't he? He works it with that Towie crowd and all people is comped and he works rest at crowd, doesn't he? But the yeah. actual shows are shite, but he's going around explaining why they're shite. So then people want to come again because they've met yeah. him again. So I think there's too much of that gone on. There's too much of that bot account gone on. And I think there's too much of that fake news gone on on social media like Joshua Fury's a done deal. How long was that ago? Three months ago. Done deal. What? Why? Show me a fucking contract. There's no done deal. They're never going to fight. People in the industry know that Joshua and Fury will never fight while I've got an hole in my ass, porky pig. Do you know what I mean? But he was putting out stuff because he has to put stuff out. Like he said, Klitschko against Joshua at Wembley, 90,000. Well done. They had Wilder flown over first class, right? Wilder were there, and, and Adam Smith said, what's next for you? And he said, the winner of this. Eddie said the same. That was three and a half year ago. Wilder were going to fight the winner of Joshua Fury three and a half year ago. I said it wouldn't happen. And what's happened? 42 months later, we're still fucking waiting for Wilder. Wilder Joshua, sorry, not Wilder Fury. Wilder, because Joshua beat Vladimir, didn't he? Yeah. Did Wilder get a pundit job on the night? They paid him fucking thousands of pounds, flew him over, put him in Hilton, whatever. It never happened, did it? Joshua didn't want to go near him, did he? They didn't want to. But do you remember it all goes back to that night he knocked Audley Harrison out in Manchester while Joshua were in crowd? I were in crowd that night. Barry Earn said they were never going to put him near him. That was eight years ago. And everybody said I was full of shit. Wilder has not been allowed to go near Joshua, has he? Do you know why? They know. He's got a fucking chandelier for a chin. 
but they're going to keep him earning out. They're going to keep milking it till the public turn off. When the public turn off, they'll throw him under a bus, won't they? Yeah, they'll sell his name. We know, don't we? We know about all that, don't we? All right, then, moving on. <clears throat> We've spoke about the bias and that, but has Tony Bellew's bias now become out of control after the tweets he's put out this week regarding looking... Do you know, do you know what, mate? I've lost interest in Bellew. Like, he's, he, he's just there... I think he retired and he realised actually he misses being famous. That's all it is. What He's just trying to be disappearing. I, 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 do you know what I mean? I don't even care anymore. He, he, he'll be around boxing for as long as he's cool with Eddie Hearn. As long as Hearn's in boxing, Bellew's there. Never get rid of him. You think it'd be that long, yeah? Yeah, look, he's one of, like, one of Hearn's originals, isn't he? So I can see that happening. So, do you think that, who do you think out of that sky lot, Bellew, Barker, Bean, uh, Spencer Oliver, and there was the other one, Johnny Nelson, out of the famous five, who's the biggest rimmer? Maybe Spencer Oliver. Spencer Oliver, Spencer Oliver, old jug ears. Spencer Oliver's biggest rimmer out of a lot of them, yeah? Mm. What bigger than Bellew? Yeah, but but Bellew Bellew's there by right. Like you know what I mean, he made money for Eddie, so he's there by right. Right, right. more about Barker. He also made money for Eddie. What about Nelson? Ah, you need Johnny there, man. Like you know, what because they know that they they know like if it wasn't Johnny, they'd have to get they'd have to get Lennox in there. And you know Lennox and Dosha don't really get along, so just keep Johnny in there for now. Johnny, keep the minority vote. Johnny Horse Cock Nelson. What about uh, Darren Barker? Did I just say he made some money for for? Her? Yeah, I can't see him making that much money. He never said he wasn't a big ticket seller. Yeah, but Gill Sturm that was enough money for her at a time when her needed that. What about the new nickname that they're calling them? The Bean Masons. Who, who's calling them that? Certain people on social media are saying that it's now a cult and that uh, they're not, there's, there's Freemasons and there's the Bean Masons. <laughs> nah, it's, you know what it is, Russ? It's just a good gravy train to be on and people yeah. just will do as they're told as long as they can stay on it. Yeah. Do you think that's what it is? They're just getting paid to. They're getting paid and put up and the party and foot week weekend. Yeah, and you can go anywhere on fight week. You can do what you want on fight week. Yeah, if you're a boxing fan, I imagine that's just heaven. Yeah. All right, then. Well, let, let's finish off on the last one. I'm going to leave this one for Coogie Bear. Coogan Cassius, a.k.a. whatever your name is, Ramanathan, whatever. Coogan Cassius has done an interview with Shannon Courtney and... It was three weeks after her she got beat. Did you think she got beat? Yeah, she got beat. She fought, she fought over eight rounds. In the interview, she admitted she lost the first round where she got dropped, which is a 10-8. She admitted she lost a 10-9 a round in the last one. So that leaves six rounds, but she's three rounds down with one judge, one referee, because they want her our foster. So the six rounds left, and she's admitted she's three rounds round with them six. How on earth can she expect Howard Foster to give her all of them six rounds that she says she won? I don't, that's how fighters think, Russ. And I wouldn't want I wouldn't want Shannon Courtney to change her story. She should be deluded enough to believe she she should think she won every round. Yeah, that's the mindset of a fighter. You know this, man. Your mates will call fraud. Carl's as deluded as they come. Whoa, is he? Remember they did that video, Call the Contradiction Frog? Yeah, I remember that, yeah. You remember that? When, when, when Calzaghi went on Strictly Come Dancing, whatever it was, and he just said, yeah, that's Strictly Embarrassing. And then they had the video of Carl doing the ice dancing. That's dancing, though. That's not boxing, is it, Terry? No, but it's the same principle, right? These guys are just deluded. Whatever they think in the moment is what's real to them. And so I'm never going to say to Shannon, don't think that. 
that's fine. She's she's that's exactly that's what keeps her going. Did you think she lost though? Yeah. I thought she lost. But, but it's not her job to think she lost. It's her but, team's job to think she lost. And it's for her job to think she won. But what about Shannon coming out? She refused interviews after the fight, didn't she? Yeah. Right. She comes out then three weeks later and does an interview on World Suicide Day saying that she suffers from mental health. What do you think to that? But I've known Shannon for about five or six years, uh, Porky. And she doesn't take defeats well. She never has done. Right? She got beaten at Gay Box Cup, didn't she? And stormed off, didn't she, as well? Yeah, she's been beaten a few times and she, she hasn't reacted well. But I don't want her to react well. Like, you've got to be a sore loser. I'm okay with that. But yeah, it's I'm about okay what you do when you come that. back. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Be a sore loser. Because that shows me you're still hungry. That shows me you're still, it still burns in you. When you accept the defeat, I worry. Do you agree that the fact that IFL turned the comments off on Shannon Courtney's interview because she was something like 600 dislikes and 300 likes? 100%. People shouldn't be trolling her. She, she did her job. She lost on the night. That's fair play. Like, yeah. Why would anyone, you know, why troll her? Like, the defeat's painful enough for her. Yeah, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Well... Uh, if you go to my uh, channel and look at the Shannon Courtney thing, I think it's like under than five likes and four dislikes. Yeah, and just make sure you subscribe to Porky's Corner, people. And like, yeah, you know, this, you know, this is the only way you get this straight into your inbox. <laughs> Do you know what, mate? I've been going three year in November twenty seventh, right? Three year and. I'm past caring now, but my channel's going in the right direction. I'm really happy. I never thought I'd get to this stage after begin after the start I had. But right, all right then. It's been uh, emotional, Terry, yet again. Yeah, always a pleasure. We always we always do good numbers. You're always in my top twenty. But and I, don't forget, I've done a thousand and eighty videos, and you're always in my top twenty when I have you on. So you must have a bit of a following, the old, the beautiful podcast, YouTube, Terry Chap, Terry, Terry. I, I, I don't even have a YouTube presence. I think people, people just like hearing common sense, I think. So yeah, that's we what we keep do. keep it real, don't we? Well, we like to do, don't we, Terry? Yeah. We like to keep exactly. it real. Uh, I think we've covered, I just want to finish off on Isaac Chamberlain. I was very impressed by his last win. Yeah, listen, I just want to see Isaac active. Um, like Isaac, let, Isaac's a good friend of mine. He's a close friend, um, and it's rare to say in boxing. I, you know, I've, I've been, I've been there in the dark times, so I'm enjoying seeing his renaissance. Oh. I'd like people to don't, don't press him to fight anyone till next year. Let him get three or four fights this year, get his his ring rust off, get him used to being back on the scene, and then next year we'll start looking for these Bill and Smith react poor fights. Yeah. Uh, can I just ask how your friend Martin and the other kid from Andy, is it from New Age Pod Farm? New Age. New Age. How, you know, how are they? I think the lads are all right. You know, we, we, we WhatsApp each other regularly. Um, we're probably going to do a show this year at some point just to, to finish off the, the lockdown Will that be saga. in London, Terry? Uh, well, it's not going to be live, so I don't know what we're going to do yet. We haven't oh, discussed right, okay. it. I'm sure we will. Yeah. Well, that'd be, I'll, if you could get me on that one, I'll drive down to Milton Keynes. <laughs> <laughs> well, make a night of it, eh? If you're ready. All right, then, mate. Well, that's brilliant. All right, then. Well, listen, it's been a pleasure. All the best to your mum and your lass, and I hope you're well. Same with your family, mate. All right, always always a pleasure. I'll speak to you soon, okay, folks? I'm going to run to the loo now. All right, then, mate. You take care because you've been drinking every... <laughs> No, 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 I just need to shit. Pardon the language, but I do. Oh, all right. <laughs> you take care, mate. Right, take care, mate. Bye. Bye. Bye.